for now. Here we are. Welcome, everyone. Um, as we normally do uh, when you arrive, yeah, do a shout out. Hi, Nadia from Sweden. So just do a shout out to um, where you're coming from today. It's always really heartening to see. Hi, Indiana. Indiana. Excellent. Mumbai. Mumbai. Love okay, it. Tel Aviv. Okay, good. Hi, everyone. I'm closing down my noisy apps in the background. Yeah, good point. Silent cell phone. My cell phone. Oh, good question. I don't even know where my cell phone is. So. Yeah, even better. <laughs> Lose your cell phone. <laughs> Iowa, Bangalore. Awesome. Look now. Toronto, Pennsylvania, rural Pennsylvania. Hey, that's good. <laughs> Singapore, oh my goodness. What time is it in Singapore right now? <laughs> wow, you all are dedicated. We love this. 12 a.m. Okay, 12 hours. I guess it could be worse. <laughs> my brother lives in Japan and I think it's like 13 different. So very challenging to find times to Zoom with them. <laughs> Uh, super. Oh, hey, Caitlin. I see you there. Um, all right. Well, so uh, welcome, everyone. Um, here we are. We are talking today about uh, Chapter 7 of Data Feminism. And I'm just going to take a second to share my screen. One minute. Um, Lauren, do you see my slides? I do. Okay, good. I wasn't sure if I shared the right window. Um, excellent. Okay, it's been a rough week. So, um, but one of the lights of our weeks is always the this group and uh, getting to be in community with all the people from all of these amazing different places. So, so here we are. Um, this is our second to last meeting. Um, we'll have one more meeting next week to talk about the conclusion of the book and to announce, I think, um, what are shaping up to be some pretty exciting um, next steps that we want to keep you all posted about. But we'll save those for next week. Um, so as we always do, we want to open up with an indigenous land acknowledgement. So in exploring and writing about the imagined foundations of a society and a culture, we feel it necessary to acknowledge the very real foundation of our own. We therefore acknowledge the indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land where this event is taking place and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land that we are on today is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation and the, the Nilanape people. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather and perform from time immemorial. Um, and here I'm gonna pass to Lauren, we, we, we put our feminist shout outs at the beginning this week, just as a way of acknowledging um, what's happening here in the United States and to provide some resources to folks. So yeah, so if you were with us last week, um, you know that we held a minute of silence for George Floyd, for Ahmaud Arbery, for Breonna Taylor, um, who I should mention, it should have been her birthday today. Um, she would have been 27 years old. Um, for Tony McDade um, and for all the other black men and women who had really just been murdered at the hands of the police. Um, and there are unfortunately even more names to add even in this past week. Um, among them, David McAtee of Louisville killed by the police, James Skurlock of Omaha, a protester killed by a racist white man. Um, 
And you know, last week we ended our one minute of silence by asking our listeners along with ourselves to take concrete steps to dismantle the anti-Black racism that really overdetermines each of our actions, um, not just in this country, but around the world. And while there are many actions that individually we each could take, um, Catherine and I thought we would each feature a few that have influenced our own thinking and actions in this past week. Um, and so these are the couple that I thought that I would feature. Um, I'm in the middle of reading group. Oh. So can you let me keep going? Oh. Or do you want to learn about these resources that I'm gonna, about to talk about? Oh. Okay, if you want to, just sit, okay? <laughs> Um, so the first, um, so I sort of separated them into uh, a couple of different categories, although obviously, um, as we've been discussing, they, these categories are not, not hard and fast. Um, so uh, the first one has to do with sort of educating yourself, and I wanted to direct you to the African American Intellectual History Society's Prison Abolition Syllabus 2.0. This actually um, is a document from 2018. Um, it was drafted in response to a nationwide prison strike, and it was actually building upon a 2016 strike that had prompted the creation of the first syllabus. Um, but everything, everything still applies. Um, it, so the syllabus, it's very comprehensive. It's a multi-author document. It goes back as far as Jeremy Bentham and talking about the origins of the Panopticon um, and the history of punishment, and it works its way back up to the present, closing with a, a week on the prison abolition movement, um, which is really closely connected to the police abolition, the calls we've been seeing for police abolition in the past um, couple of days and weeks. Um, the next one I wanted to direct your attention to, it's a Google Doc, which is why I didn't paste the link in the, in the slide. Um, but it's this really nicely uh, sort of scaffolded anti-racist uh, sort of suggestions of resources and even terms of engagement, very concrete terms of engagement for how you sort of build both your own and others who you encounter in your everyday conversations, their own sort of understanding of racism, how to be a good ally, um, and things like this. And so it sort of identifies key arguments and phrases that you might hear people repeating back to you um, and sort of how you respond to that with clear and concrete ways. Um, the third thing I wanted to direct your attention to is this document, also a Google Doc, Resources for Accountability and Actions for Black Lives, which again is very specific things you can do, ranging from signing petitions to making phone calls to your elected officials, um, to take action about uh, sort of for things right now about defunding the police in your city or town or state. Um, or um, sort of signing on to show up for things. And so I like that, again, because there are small items, but uh, there's tangible things you can do in the world. And then finally, just um, a more general uh, infographic, which is what you see in the image, created by Leslie Mack, um, which just provides some general guidelines. And she makes the point, she's like, look, there's so many calls for action right now, and everyone does want to act, and that's terrific. Um, however, you should think a little bit before you just sort of plus one yourself to anything that you see, where it's coming from, who it was started by, if it erases previous actions that have already been ongoing, especially those that are led by Black people, um, and so on. And so I just really like that. It's a really nice distillation of that, um, of that, of sort of that thought process. And I'm going to pass it over to Catherine and attempt to deal with the background chaos that. Uh, I apologize for subjecting you to. Oh my gosh, I was muted. <laughs> I've just been doing all this explaining. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me start over. Um, it, so I wanted to offer a couple of resources that are from a more personal note for folks, individuals who have been really instrumental to my own learning 
Um, and in particular, these are resources for people who are white and who uh, want to learn how to be a better anti-racist ally um, and really think about their own whiteness in the process. Um, or these may also be folks um, who, for folks who are working within white dominant institutions. Um, because one of the things is, is like, this is very hard work. So there's all these like, there's all these resources right now. And so there's a lot we can do from self-education. Um, and then there's um, other options, which I think are really helpful, which are to hire people to teach you. Um, and also to do this work with other white people in community um, where we can learn from each other. Um, and so one of the folks who's been instrumental in my own work, um, who was a co-lead on a project that we organized around uh, breastfeeding and postpartum care is a woman named Jen Roberts, who runs the Versed Education Group. Um, she has years and years of experience uh, doing uh, organizational change, in particular in education, um, but really helping to facilitate conversations around race and equity and uh, kind of white dominant cultures and environments. Um, and uh, she's incredible and um, just uh, I, she set me on a path of lifelong learning. Um, and so I think she's, she would be amazing for any folks who are looking to bring somebody into their organization. Um, and then secondly, um, I just want to highlight the fact that, um, you know, this, this work is hard and we need guides. Um, and so one of my own personal guides is a man named Chris Miller, who's a white man. Um, and he does a lot of uh, executive coaching. Um, he also supervises small groups to do uh, learning together about navigating whiteness and practicing anti-racism. Um, and when we first started doing this, this is a couple of years ago on a research project I was a part of, like, I don't really understand this. This is like therapy for white people. And that's exactly what it is. Um, it's therapy for white people. Um, and I have continued working with him since then in an individual capacity because um, the learnings that I got from him really have blown my mind and continue to um, help keep me focused on the idea that being anti-racist is a practice and unlearning whiteness is a practice. And, you know, we make many mistakes along the way. Um, and the important thing, especially as white folks, is that we continue on the path of practicing the work. So, um, so in any case, I just want to say that like there are, there are guides and places to go out there um, for, for doing this work. Um, okay, so logistical info. Um, uh now uh regular stuff um please post your questions in the q a um and if folks in the chat if you see good questions in the chat tell those folks to post those questions in the q a um don't raise your hand we can't unfortunately we can't monitor all the different windows <laughs> so we're not monitoring the raising hands that stuff um there's this google doc that folks have been adding to uh at beta live set up a data feminism reading group list on twitter my son is slowly working on better captions for our videos. It's, it's really slow because he's been doing a lot of uh, actual playing with his friends recently. <laughs> so uh, that, that work has slowed down. Um, and then again, a shout out to Elvia Vasconcelos and um, for her amazing sketch notes that are accompanying every single session of, uh, of this group. And then quick shout outs to Teruyo Shinohara, which is where an artist whose work is in the Met Metropolitan Museum. That's uh, where my background comes from. Um, and to Lauren, semi-famous painter aunt, whose work is in her background, real kind of physical work in her house. Um, and our child care today, as usual, is brought to you by Lauren's parents and Catherine's nanny. <laughs> So today we're talking about the last chapter of the book. Uh, we do have a conclusion and we will meet next week, uh, which we're thinking it might be just next week's gonna be like one extended feminist shout out. <laughs> but, um, but we still have a really important topic to move through, um, which is labor. So the seventh principle of data feminism is uh, to make labor visible. Um, and the shorthand for that is to show your work. Um, and the principle goes like this. The work of data science, like all work in the world, is the work of many hands. Data feminism makes this labor visible so that it can be recognized and valued. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is the intersection of data and labor. Um, and what we try to do in this chapter is introduce a whole, there are, there's been so much amazing feminist work on labor. So we try to introduce a whole host of um, feminist con conceptions of labor and show how they relate to uh, data, 
AI and the, the data economy. So I'll pass to Lauren. Um, great. Um, so you may have noticed that a lot of our chapters begin with a comparison between like a good object and a bad object. So you can think about um, the two maps we talked about in the challenge power chapter, the, Gwendol the Gwendolyn Warren map and versus the redlining map or the visualizations of gun violence that we talked about in the chapter on emotion, um, the sort of bar chart versus the periscopic sort of animated emotional visualization. Um, so in this chapter, we break down that binary um, by beginning with an object that is kind of both good and bad, and it's what you see here, um, is GitHub. And we should say upfront that GitHub, it has a, the company has a ton of problems. Um, their co-founder is a confirmed sexual harasser. Um, they underpay their women employees. They create hostile work environments for trans employees. Um, there has been studies shown that GitHub contributors who explicitly identify as women, so ex say um, in their user account um, that they are a woman, um, have a harder time getting their code contributions accepted than those who explicitly identify as men. Um, but sort of in spite of these problems, or actually as we're going to sort of high, high speculate um, in a couple of slides, Precisely because of these problems, um, GitHub makes an interesting intervention that could be understood as feminist. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about like the complexity of this example later. But I wanted to call your attention to what you're looking at, um, which is a visualization of the work of writing collaborative code. Um, so more specifically, these are this is a visualization of the contributions to one of the projects from my research lab. Um, and what you can see here are these little area charts that show the number of lines of code written by each of the three students who contributed to this particular project. Um, and what this does is it makes their otherwise invisible work, so literally invisible, so they do it from their dorm rooms on their computers, um, and then it gets merged into this website that we built together that users see. Um, it makes their work visible so that it can be credited and valued. Um, and for the most part, you know, with many caveats, which we'll spend the hour talking about, this is a good thing. So I'm going to pass back to Catherine. So making work visible is a good thing. Um, but why is it a feminist thing specifically? Um, and so this has to do with the original example of invisible labor, which is housework. Um, housework is invisible in two ways. So first of all, it takes place in the home. So it's like literally out of sight. It's sort of in a sphere that we consider to be private. Um, but in an, uh, for another reason, it's also unpaid. It's unwaged work. So it's invisible to a marketplace that values labor as being waged work. Um, and because it's invisible to the marketplace, it doesn't earn somebody money. It's also undervalued or unvalued, at least within the context of a capitalist society. Um, and so it was this whole generation of feminist activists and feminist labor studies scholars who helped expose the value of invisible labor and also helped to theorize the phenomenon. A recent book about this uh, like pretty incredible wages for housework campaign, which became, we talked a little bit about it, but it became a very global campaign in the 1970s, um, was written by scholar Louise Toupin for folks who are interested in learning more. This is a, a just came out like a couple of years ago. Um, so it's a really interesting history of, of the movement. Um, and then one of the interesting things I learned when we were uh, in the writing process and was doing some of the research on wages for housework is that there was the big wages for housework kind of international organization. And then there were also autonomous groups within wages for housework that were explicitly organized around sort of intersectional concerns. Um, so there was black women for wages for housework um, which called for international solidarity of black women um, and had this really quite incredible agenda that called for not only paying women for housework, but also all of their unwaged work over time. So they were like kind of taking this really long historical view um, and they included reparations for slavery and imperialism and neocolonialism. It was like, like a really kind of incredible vision that they articulated. Um, and then there were other autonomous groups, things like wages do le lesbians, for example, which lobbied for additional funds to compensate social discrimination uh, faced by lesbians and so on. So this is like just, it's like a really fascinating, um, a, a fascinating sort of moment in time. Um, I'll pass this back to them. 
Sure. Um, so, you know, another thing to add about this whole idea of invisible labor is that the original term used to describe, for instance, in the wages for housework movement, um, to describe this, uh, this sort of general idea of invisible labor, which is the term that most people use today, was a reproductive labor. And, you know, when you hear that term, you usually think reproductive, or maybe I don't know what people think, but, you know, you could think like reproductive, like reproduction, like making babies or something like that. Um, but the term was actually intended to sort of have two resonances. Um, and the other one was to distinguish it both from uh, sort of both from the productive labor of the marketplace, so labor that produces things that can be sold or that produces money or capital. Um, and then what traditional accounts of labor contrasted productive labor with, they called it unproductive labor, um, meaning that those forms of labor, the forms of labor that didn't produce any like a tangible thing that could be sold. Um, but the intervention of the term reproductive labor what this does um, is that it allows you to recognize things like housework and related tasks like caring for children as um, labor that is sort of uh, functionally reproductive, right? It's the very thing that allows the productive part of the economy to continue. And I think many of us, you know, cue my daughter earlier, um, are experiencing a version of this right now with the absence of childcare. We cannot do our jobs because there is no one else to perform the otherwise invisible labor of childcare. Um, and then one of the interesting things that's happened since the advent of the web is an expansion of the definition of reproductive or invisible labor to include sort of the many and multiple and complicated forms of labor that take place online. So there are theorists like Zania Terranova who have argued for all of our tweets and Facebook posts and our Instagram stories as a form of an invisible labor. And the analogy works pretty well with some asterisks, which we'll get to. Um, you know, but we don't get paid for all of that work. Um, we don't even consider it work. Um, and this is sort of an interesting facet of this form of work. Um, but it's ex exactly this effort that allows these corporations like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, which is also Facebook, um, to themselves reproduce. So to just not just keep on going, but actually to profit and to thrive. And just very quickly back to the GitHub example, um, someone once made a comment, and I, it actually it was not my original idea, and I wish I remembered who first, it was in a question that I received from the audience, and I wish I could remember who um, made it. But they were like, isn't it, there, isn't it most likely that GitHub has those visualizations built in as this fundamental part of its platform, precisely because it was mostly men who were doing this invisible work of coding and they hated not getting credit for it. Um, and this was the reason they were so quick to implement the visualization feature um, that I began by talking about. And the more I thought about it, I was like, this is, this is totally right because it's the dominant group with access to the platform who themselves want more recognition. They were not concerned about feminist theories of invisible labor at all. Um, they were concerned about themselves and making sure that their now invisible profits um, could be compensated. And we see actually this as a larger phenomenon um, as more and more work sort of takes place at home. It becomes uh, sort of uh, pre precaritized. Um, and again, we'll talk about this throughout the, the hour today. So I don't want to get into too much now, but I just want this to be in the back of your mind. Um, sort of what happens as invisible labor expands to encompass more and more aspects of our economy. Great. <clears throat> um, but so then there's a really important related point to make, uh, which comes from Angela Davis and Bell Hooks uh, and a number of uh, Black feminists. Um, is that actually some people were being paid for housework um, and it was usually the black women or the lower class women, the poor women who were being paid. Um, and so the point here is that the effects of reproductive labor or invisible labor are not experienced equally across all of the social groups. Um, and so here we quote Angela Davis and she's saying, because of the added intrusion of racism, vast numbers of Black women have had to do their own housekeeping and other women's home chores as well. Um, so the domestic labor of women of color was and remains underwaged labor, so paid but underpaid, um, meaning that its economic worth is below its actual value. Um, and the low cost of that labor is what allows many white and middle class and wealthy women to participate in the more lucrative waged labor market instead. Um, and then, you know, this quote from Angela Davis just I think harkens back to uh, one of the things we, we quoted from Bell Hooks in the beginning where she has this 
at right around the same time has this really amazing critique of the feminine mystique, which if you remember, this is Betty Friedan's book that comes out in the 1960s about the kind of housewife uh, phenomenon of like uh, unsatisfied housewives, um, the problem without a name. Um, but Bell Hook says, uh, Frieden did not discuss who would be called in to take care of the children and maintain the home if more women like herself were freed from their house labor and given equal access with white men to the professions. She didn't speak of the needs of women without men, without children, without homes. She ignored the existence of all non-white women and poor white women. She didn't tell readers whether it was more fulfilling to be a maid, a babysitter, a factory worker, a clerk, or a prostitute than to be a leisure class housewife. Um, and so it's important to think about how, again, like um, just, you know, repeating the mantra of uh, intersectionality, like how much we miss when we're only looking at gender alone. And so it's really the um, pushback from black feminism, black feminism on white feminism, kind of enlarging the scope of the consideration. Pass in. So this, uh, this conversation about racialized labor just relates to the footnote that I wanted to feature this week, um, which names uh, what I think are some of the most canonical texts about race, gender, and labor in the first half of the history of the United States and even before in the colonial era, sort of bounded by the era of slavery. Um, these include actually an early essay by Angela Davis. I saw people in the chat uh, talking about how Angela Davis and is just an amazing person for this moment because of her commitment to prison abolition. Um, and I, you know, I have to say, you know, it's interesting. There's a couple of people, sort of figures in the book that, you know, Catherine and I, as we were doing research, you know, be like, oh, we have an idea. Like, let's, you know, find out who we can cite on this or, um, you know, I wonder if who's been talking about this. And then there's a couple of people who just are like always there with the take that you want, who have anticipated this issue, you know, decades before it ever came to our minds. Um, you know, Donna Haraway, I think, is some, sometimes that person for me, and Angela Davis is another one of those people where it's like, of course, like, Angela Davis had something to say about this that is genius. Um, and so anyways, this is an early essay of hers. Um, and it, this also includes, I don't know if you can read the author uh, names on these three other books, um, titles by Stephanie Camp, Jennifer Morgan, Thavalia Glimp. Um, these are sort of canonical references if you study the history of Black women's labor in the United States. And I wanted to make sure that you saw these books and heard these names and read the footnote. Okay, um, but so why does um, racialized labor matter in the present? It seems actually like we wrote this, I typed in these notes like, you know, I don't know when I typed them in, but obviously like, well, duh. Um, anyway, so I think you, many of our listeners already know the answer to this. Um, but just to sort of, you know, make explicit the connections that we're drawing in the chapter. Um, so racialized labor is all over the web. Um, so what you see here um, on the left is an image of a person's hand. Uh, the hand is dark skinned and it's caught in the process of scanning one of the books digitized through the Google Books program. It's actually a copy of Du Bois, um, the, uh, one of the songs that he includes, um, which to me has a particular kind of uncanny resonance. Um, this actually, that image is from, there's a Tumblr called The Art of Google Books, which captures all of these interesting glitches in Google Book scans, um, many of which contain people's hands on the pages, not all, but some of them do. Um, and then on the right, we have a still from a short documentary, which we cite in the book, um, created by Andrew Norman Wilson. Um, and it's about how Google in particular has what are in effect two classes of employees. Um, with, uh, it, it has its full-time salaried employees um, who do things like software development and manage HR. Um, and then there's this whole other class of temporary workers who do the things like scanning the books. They are, and uh, Wilson is one of the people to, uh, to point this out, they are literally given different color badges. Um, they're not allowed in certain buildings. Um, and these temporary workers are not granted access to any of like Google's famed perks, you know, like the cafeteria um, or the scooters or whatever. And of course, it is predominantly women and people of color who make up the second class of Google workers. Um, you know, another person who has a great analysis of this is the information, scholar, information studies scholar Lily Arani. Um, and she shows how, quote, 
Today's hierarchy of data labor echoes the older gendered, class, and race technology hierarchies that we experienced before. So you might think back to the experience of someone like Christine Darden, who we talked about in the book, um, or all the stories that we've heard at this point that have sort of been mythologized about the women computers. Um, so anyway, so, um, so by this quote, uh, Irani attends to draw in um, all of these critiques like uh, Angela Davis's, which we cited before, Bell Hooks, you know, these that are coming from women of color labor studies scholars. Um, uh, Evelyn Nakano Glenn is another person. Um, anyway, all of, these, all of these critiques still hold true today in very similar ways. So Irani also gives us another valuable term, which is this idea of cultural data work, um, by which she means the people on which the entire information economy depends. Um, and a project that she's engaged with for a long time around this is uh, the example of Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, and this is a platform on which uh, many data science projects, many research projects in general depend, as well as many other things. Um, and so the way Amazon Mechanical Turk works, for those of you who don't know, is that if I'm an employer, I might post a job. And the jobs are small. They're, this is like a what's called a micro task platform. So there are things like fill out a survey or label something in a photograph. Um, and then it goes to people. So real human beings behind the scenes, they do the job and they get paid in these like tiny micro payments. So it's like micro work for micro payments. Um, the jobs themselves are called hits and they represent these micro tasks. Um, and as with many of these sort of uh, capitalist oriented platforms, the features provided by the platform, Amazon Mechanical Turk, hosted by Amazon, right? um, they favor the employers, the people posting the jobs, not the workers, the people who are doing the jobs. Um, the workers who complete tasks are identified with ID numbers, so it kind of like hides their humanity from their employer. Um, they have no way on the platform to communicate with each other. So if there's something like a shady employer who fails to pay them for the task, or somebody has posted a job and said, oh, we think this will take 15 minutes of time, but actually it takes three hours, um, there's bas basically like no accountability mechanism for employers. Um, so Turk Opticon, which is a project of Lily Arani and uh, Six Silverman, among others, um, they set out to change that and really early on, it's important to know that this project started in 2008, um, the project helps workers communicate with each other. Um, they report shady employers, they basically like rate the employers and then they can take jobs from good employers. So this is what we might call a counter data project, a way of informing workers so that they can make better decisions. Um, and then one, just one thing we wanna mention about Turkopticon is that in the writing of the book, we actually mentioned how Irani and Silberman and the other organizers were very burnt out from running Turk Opticon for a long time and it was shutting down. And we describe it as being shutting down in the book. Um, but in fact, I've recently spoken with Lily Irani about this and we're doing an updated footnote um, because this has now changed. And in the past year, they've been building coalitions with Turk workers and they're going to be relaunching it. Um, so it's not going away, but they're actually, um, they're organizing and um, a new way of governance and self-governance um, for the platform, which is super exciting. So I'll pass back to Lauren. Okay. Um, so, you know, as we've sort of started to suggest, um, so this cultural data work that we've been talking about, it isn't always like anodyne assignments, like, you know, identifying pictures of cars or whatever. Um, it can also involve working with deeply, deeply upsetting content. And that's actually what you see in the headline from Wired um, that we have up here on the screen. Um, and that actually, they did sort of like an expose that brought this particular issue into a national spotlight. And then in the book that you see here, Ghost Work, um, Mary Gray and Siddharth Suri help show how there is a global underclass of workers who are performing this type of work um, for all of the platforms and systems like Uber and Amazon that seem to the user automated and seamless. Um, and that's because there are human workers in the loop. And just as in so many other areas of our life, the coronavirus has brought this issue too out into the open. So at the bottom, you can see some of the reportage on how Facebook and Twitter um, were experiencing the effects of their human content mod moderators not being able to come into work um, in the early days before they'd figured out the security for remote work um, in the form of increased spam in all of our feeds, pornography, hate speech, and so on. 
So um, in the book, we make the case that this exploitation of precarious, racialized, colonial labor follows the pattern of the original form of exploitative labor, which is slavery. Um, and we thought this sort of wasn't really a, up for debate, this argument, but a few people in the online peer review thought that we should clarify the connection between exploitative labor, capitalism, and slavery. Um, and so we ended up including the story that is often told among historians and other scholars of slavery in order to demonstrate the sort of inextricable link between capitalism and the enslavement of human beings. And it's about um, a British slave ship called the Zong. And the short version is this. So in 1781, um, the ship was crossing the Atlantic and it ran off course. And the crew realized that they didn't have enough drinking water for both themselves and their captives. Um, there were, I believe, 133 captives and maybe you know, a dozen or more uh, crew members. Um, so the captain performed like a literal cost benefit analysis um, and determined that he could kill the captives by throwing them overboard. Um, and he would still collect enough insurance money at the end of the journey to come out ahead. And so in that way, he could save the drinking water for his crew. Um, it's like, it's a, it's a horrifying calculation and a horrifying story. And, you know, I think a lot about scholars like C.T. Hartman, who would tell us, say, just like, don't retell this. Um, and I actually am not sure that I would have included it in this week's presentation, except that just last week, we saw a White House advisor say in the context of COVID that we have enough, quote, we had, the quote was, we have, quote, enough human capital stock to go back to work. And then he decided, he sort of denied that he need, meant anything nefarious by using that phrase um, when, you know, scholars and citizens and everyone pointed out that there was an uncanny resonance with the legacies of slavery, especially as we see Black people and people of color, Latinx people, being disproportionately affected by COVID. So anyway, so I thought it was important to include this brief history so that the imbrications of capitalism and slavery like are crystal clear to our listeners um, and, uh, and to everyone as you pass on this knowledge. Okay. Sometimes we, so sometimes we hear these cruel and terrible stories from the past where in this case, the cost of human lives is literally calculated in dollars and then those lives are disposed of. Um, and then we feel now like hundreds of years later, some comfort that the story is over, right? Um, but I think the point that we try to make in this chapter is that the world that permitted the Zong is not over. Um, in fact, it's actually been accelerated with the help of data and AI. Um, and so filmmakers like Ava DuVernay, who did this amazing documentary, The 13th, which you can watch on Netflix. Um, she makes the connection between slavery, mass incarceration, and then the cheap labor that companies like BP then use to clean up their environmental disasters. Um, or if we think about the global colonial context, we might consider how the cobalt used to produce the lithium ion batteries in our cell phones um, is associated with significant human rights violations. Uh, coerced labor from Congolese children as young as seven. Um, so like the story of the Zong is here, basically. It's still with us. Um, so, you know, I think I'm going to pivot here and I'm, there's not really a good way to do this. Um, so I'll just go for it. Um, so like, obviously, like the stakes could not be higher. We're talking about human lives, right? Um, and yet, when we sort of start talking about completely overhauling global capitalism, it can start to seem overwhelming, like especially now, um, you know, because it's like, you know, we are dealing with these forces that are historic, they are ongoing, you know, they, these, are, these are the largest systems that we can think of, right? Um, but our approach in this book is always to sort of think about small actionable steps that will get us ever so slightly cl closer to the goal that we all share. So this is a sort like a inadequate, um, small, <laughs> incomplete list of some things we can do in data science to push back against um, these large forces of global capitalism. And so you can see them here. And actually, you know, as we're, end, we're sort of approaching the end of the book, we've actually already talked about most of them. Um, but there are a couple of new ones that we'll share in the remaining time today. So one is to bring a feminist power analysis into data analysis. Um, 
The second is to just reject false binaries in all forms, in all situations. Um, the third is to include multiple and marginalized voices in your process, whatever your process may be. Um, four, uh, context, 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 um, or what uh, theory nerds would say, uh, always contextualize. Um, uh, and then the fifth one, which we're going to talk about now, involves tracing data sets, tracing models, visualizations back to their sources. So yeah, so um, as an example of work that tries to trace the contours of global capitalism, I mean, these are, this is a complex system we've arrived at, um, but work that attempts to try to do this, to trace the technology, trace the data back to the source, um, is this project called Anatomy of an AI System, which is by a technology researcher, Kate Crawford, and design scholar, Vladen Yoler. Um, and so this is a diagram of Borgesian proportions. Um, and it starts from a single data-driven device, the Amazon Echo. And then it describes, it tries to describe and then diagram the human labor, the data dependencies, and all of the material resources that contribute to the production of a single Amazon Echo. Um, and I just want to note, like, this diagram is so big that you can't look at it on a single computer screen. We printed it. I actually wanted to show you in the book that we, we printed it the largest possible way we could, which is we put it onto two pages and as a two page, full page, oh wait, I gotta, here, I'll put it against my body. <laughs> um, a, a two page spread. And yeah, even at the maximum size for our book, some of the text is like in two point font. Like you, you like literally can't read it, it's so complex. Um, and this diagram was accompanied with a 9,000 word essay, which was Crawford's contribution. Um, and the essay ranges from mineral extraction required to produce the electronics components, um, hard labor and child labor that this task requires. Um, the, the chart and narrative then go through processes of refining, uh, assembling, distributing the components that go into the system, the little hardware components, transporting those things physically uh, from places around the world to the place where they're going to be assembled, um, transporting them uh, through virtually through the infrastructure of the internet. It traces them inside the Amazon corporate boundary, shows the layers of workers and employees inside of Amazon who provide everything from sort of network maintenance on which, of course, the Amazon Echo relies for continuous connectivity, databases, storage, and so on, um, to then also doing like things like training data sets and so on. Um, and so they emphasize just kind of through the sheer like insanity <laughs> of the diagram um, and the exhaustive detailing of like each of these components of the system, that's what is required for the system to work is people. So um, they actually write, uh, Crawford writes at every level, contemporary technology is deeply rooted in and running on the exploitation of human bodies. Um, so this is like this dazzling but also terrible expose of the invisible labor involved in making a single product on a global scale. Um, so in this way, we, we really feel like this is a very uh, ambitious example of the seventh principle of data feminism, which is to show your work. Um, and so behind this, it, it, it sort of demonstrates to us that behind the magic and the marketing and all the automation that's sold to us as data products, there's always this hidden labor. So it's often hidden labor performed by women and people of color. Um, and it's also underwaged and undervalued. Um, but so what we can do as data feminists is to make that labor visible in all of its complexity um, so that it can be acknowledged and appropriately valued and so that it's truer cost for people and for the planet can be recognized. So this image and this project is sort of the equal but opposite version of the anatomy, anatomy, of, anatomy of an AI project. So that one involved months of meticulous research. Um, it originated from a single device, but sort of exploded outwards to trace all of the individuals who went unnamed um, and sort of systems that went uncredited and producing it. Um, in order to credit all the labor involved in this work. Um, this visualization is sort of like it gets the reverse. So it was created by a single person, um, Benjamin Schmidt, 
Um, and what this involves is a visualization of the catalog records of the Library of Congress. Um, and what's interesting here is that um, Ben in his work reveals some of the labor that went into uh, creating it from the work, from the data themselves. Um, so what this chart is, is just plotting the date every single book in the Library of Congress was published on the x-axis against the date in which the book was entered into the digital database on the y-axis. Um, so what you can see first on the left is the methodical nature of the process of digitizing the record. So the archivists started with the earliest books in the collection. Um, that's why it starts lower down um, uh, on the left and they worked their way slowly through. And so in the image on the left, um, but in the orange part on the right, you can see how it took from the 1960s until the early 2000s for the archivists to get through the whole Library of Congress collection. And then in the image on the right, you can see in those little sort of darker steps, those are times when over the course of a couple of years, the archivists went back to specific sub collections and worked their way through start to finish. So you get like a smaller version of the larger sort of ladder that you see um, in the image on the left. So I'm just doing another thing where we have so many more slides, <laughs> so we're going to speed up because um, uh, we want to make sure that hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for questions. Um, so the, we want to introduce just a couple more concepts from the book. Um, so images like this past one, like Ben's, help make digital labor visible. Um, but then it's also worth considering forms of digital labor that are difficult to capture in data because they don't result in these physical traces. Um, so this leads us to a concept that comes out of feminist labor studies, which is emotional labor. So the work involved in managing one's feelings or someone else's in response to the demands of a society or a particular job. Um, and then here, this brings us actually to my favorite footnote. Um, because like these other, you know, like invisible labor, like racialized labor, emotional labor applies in the digital realm as well. Um, so in their paper about uh, gender labor on the platform Wikipedia, uh, Heather Ford and Judy Walkman point to this idea that Wikipedia's editing infrastructures and culture are hostile to women. And so consequently, women editors have to do more taxing emotional labor. So strategically avoid certain types of work so that they then don't become targets for trolls on the platform. Um, and just as a side note, I just got to meet uh, Judy Wachman yesterday. So that was like a really amazing uh, sort of fangirl moment for me. <laughs> um, and then I also just want to highlight that the um, this paper, for anyone who's looking for it, this paper also has a great uh, critique of what might be called STEM pipeline studies, which um, often people frame as being like, where are the women in STEM? Where's all the missing women? Why do the women leave? Women, women, women. Um, when often, they, and they have a great critique of this, we don't ask men to change anything that they're doing. We just often ask women to be more like men so that they can enter kind of uh, masculine professions. Um, and then double side note <laughs> is that um, it, just on the note of Wikipedia, I was just reading the amazing work of Trina Grillo with my lab. Uh, she has this beautiful essay about intersectionality and anti-essentialism and just resonates so well with today's work. This was written back in 1995 and she doesn't have a Wikipedia page. So if anyone or their students are looking for an amazing feminist person to write a Wikipedia page about, Go write about Dr. Trina Grillo. <laughs> there we go. Go ahead, Lauren. Oh, okay, do you want me to do this? Okay, um, so I actually, we're gonna run out of time, but that's okay, because next week we actually have less content to cover, so we can talk more about we can deal, do a lot more questions next week. Um, so we'll save the questions from this. Like if we don't get to them, let's just save them and we'll answer some of them next week. Um, I also wanted to highlight, uh, Susan Garfinkel pointed out that I had erroneously identified the people doing the work at the Library of Congress as archivists. I should have called them librarians. Um, that is correct. Um, Okay, uh, so just very briefly, uh, sort of the this idea of emotional labor in the past like 20, 30 years has been supplemented by a related comp uh, com concept called affective labor. And this is so that the work of projecting a feeling, like this is the definition of emotion, can be distinguished from the work of experiencing the feeling itself, which is the 
definition of affect. So we can see both emotional and affective labor at work all across the tech industry. So um, in the book, we consider how, like, for instance, like call center workers or technical support specialists um, need to exercise a combination of affective, emotional, affective and emotional labor, as well as technical expertise. You know, you can think of like absorbing the rage of irate customers. So that's affective labor. Um, and then reflecting back their, you know, your own sympathy instead, which is emotional labor. And then, then actually offer your technical expertise um, and help them with their issue, um, which is like the only expertise they were sort of hired to employ. Um, you can also consider the affective labor required by women and minoritized groups sort of in all situations who need to take steps to either on the one hand disprove or on the other hand simply ignore the sexist, racist, or otherist assumptions they face either about their technical ability or about anything else. And then you need to do this at the same time as performing the emotional labor that ensures that the people who hold those assumptions are not threatened by you. Um, those people often hold positions of power. Um, and you know, we can actually see this happening right now amidst this upsurge of white allies eager to help their black friends, but are who sort of like myself included, um, who are sort of not aware or not as aware as they, uh, as they could be about the emotional and affective labor that these overtures, how, however well-intentioned, um, might require. Catherine, we flip-flopped here, but do you want to talk about this one? Yeah. Um, so maybe, Lauren, what I might suggest, why don't we talk about this example and then we'll sort of skip over care work and just mention it really fast so that we can get to... Okay, sure. That's not good. Okay. Um, so um, the question becomes here, when we're talking about like affective labor and visible labor, can we visualize this somehow or how do we visualize it? So the anatomy and the AI is a great example of that. Um, but giving this labor visual form can be a way to acknowledge it and credit it as labor. Um, and so what you see here is a visualization created by designer Georgia Lupi. Um, and it's accompanied by a musical score from Kaki King. Um, and it gets, it tries to get closer to this idea of sort of recognizing emotional labor of caregiving. Um, King's daughter was actually diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, um, which I'm not gonna try to say the name, <laughs> but it's ITP. Um, it's described as a very visual disease, so it presents as bruises and burst blood vessels all over her body. Um, and so the mother had to watch her daughter's skin and record any changes, like sort of in minute detail. And at the same time, she also reported her own feelings of hope and stress and fear and tried to create this kind of subjective data to complement the hard numbers that she was receiving from the blood tests that, that her daughter was getting um, all the time, basically. Um, so when Lupi set out to design the visualization, her goal was to evoke empathy and help the audience feel a part of this story of the interaction of two family members together in this kind of very fraught time period. Um, so she employed this sort of very fluid timeline to reflect the subjective nature of what disability scholars call crip time. It's a term from Allison Kafer. Um, and so days are the leaves, each of the leaves or the petals um, are, represents a day, um, and they're segmented by hospital visits. Um, and then red dots are employed to indicate platelet counts, and then color is used to convey the intensity of the bruises, as well as the sort of visuality of the data that the, the mother reported. Um, and then Lupi also used King's record of her feelings, um, with black corresponding to stress and fear and yellow to signify hope. Um, and then the result is rendered also as an animation. So we're really not doing it justice by just showing the static image here, but it unfolds over time and it's set to music. So it's visually and orally and temporally very um, affecting um, and a way of communicating this affective labor of mothering and care. Okay, so I'm gonna try to do like a 15 second summary of the last slide. So one, um, there is a technical or theoretical term for the type of work that uh, Kaki King was performing, and this is care work. Um, there's a really interesting intellectual history tied to this. Uh, you can learn more about it by reading our book and then reading the footnotes. Um, in uh, the context of data and metadata and the library and archive space, there's a group called the Maintainers, um, which is trying to frame the work of providing all of the work or sort of the information that holds up and allows data and data sets to become sustained, to be sustainable as care work. 
Um, it, the group is called the Maintainers, and you can check them out on their website. And then finally, um, and then finally, uh, the National Domestic Workers Alliance works with actual care workers, including some data-driven initiatives, um, and you can check them out on their website. So just to sum up, um, making labor visible, it recognizes that data product, any data product is the work of many hands. Um, it asks whose work gets credited and then whose work is screened out because of systems of oppression, privilege, and so on. Um, it seeks to credit all data work, especially undervalued and or invisible labor. And I mean, we can see just how difficult that is when we look at folks who've really tried to undertake that in a complete kind of way. Um, seeks to understand the global economic and ecological consequences of data science and data work. And I mean, I think the corollary to that is it like remembers that data work is still in the material realm, like the cloud isn't a cloud, it's very heavy and it involves server farms <laughs> um, and lots of like kind of very material consequences. Um, it can use data and data visualization to show emotional and affective labor, reproductive labor, care work, and so on. Um, and then finally, and I think Turk Opticon is a great example of this, it designs a dialogue and solidarity with workers themselves. Um, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't, I'll, I'll deal with that a little bit later. I'm sorry. Okay, Catherine, why don't you take Do you want me to do this one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so our very last feminist shout out is if you remember last week, we introduced this program that our friends from the Civic Software Foundation are running about, uh, they call it the Structured Context Program. And so this is a program that's specifically for folks who uh, from a variety of fields and from anywhere in the world who are looking to kind of take their learnings from data feminism further and think about how do we kind of like fix the problem of context, especially as it relates to uh, open public data on the web. Um, and so they uh, got in touch with us and they asked us to make an announcement to say that they've extended their application deadline. It was supposed to be today, um, but they want to make space for motion and action in the wake of um, the George Floyd's death and all of the protests and actions that are happening right now. So there's another week for folks to apply. Um, they thank folks who have applied. They are loving the applications that have come in so far. However, there was a technical glitch. So if you didn't get a confirmation about your application, maybe email them uh, at this email address and make sure that they received it. And they said they've been getting lots of questions, but they, um, yes, your application is welcome from anywhere in the world. And in fact, very much welcomes the, a global perspective. And so they would seek to recruit people globally as well. Um, so yeah, I think that was our last feminist shout out. And, oh yeah, great. Thank you, Diana. So Diana from Civic Software Foundation is there in the chat. If you have any questions about this program, feel free to engage with her there directly. Um, Maybe we'll try to do like one very fast question, Lauren. Um, sure, so I have a couple yeah. of like sort of practical suggestions. Maybe you can scroll through and find a good question, a discussion question, but just with respect to the second question about crediting invisible labor in the production of academic research. So there's a great resource called the Collaborators Bill of Rights, um, which you can Google mm -hmm. and we also reference in the book. And it has a couple of very actionable steps. Um, and then with respect to the first question, maybe I'll talk about it a little bit and then Catherine, you can decide if you want to talk about it more or something else. Um, so this is a question about what uh, fair compensation and recognition looks like for those who perform the labor of sharing traumatic personal experiences. Um, you know, on the one hand, these are very important and they're important testimony to include. On the other hand, um, the, the question asker asks, um, these narratives often erase the autonomy and careers of those who have faced discrimination. And I think the sad reality is, um, you know, you, like, you can't compensate these narratives and ex experiences fairly, right? Like that, we need to recognize that it is both an incredible burden to be asked and a burden to share. And it's a real, I think, sign of respect on the people who receive this testimony. Um, and then a, a responsibility of the receivers to 
hold on to it bec precisely because of the fact that there will never be an equal exchange in that particular relationship. But one thing to point to is just in the past, yesterday was released, um, and we'll talk more about this next week, um, uh, sort of set of guidelines from the Penn Annenberg School of Communication on centering racial e equity and data infrastructure. And it's an incredibly detailed document. You can Google it. We will talk more about it next week. Um, but they have a really good table precisely with respect to this issue of how you work with individuals and communities and community groups that are offering up their own sometimes very hard earned experience. How do you do the best you can to ensure that that data is honored and respected and carried sort of over the transition into operationalization and action in the best way with the acknowledgement that it is not a perfect way. Yeah, and I, I think the only thing that I will add i think that's such a great question and like recognizing the sharing of experiences of inequality of labor is a really important I'm really just glad that you made that connection because it's it's that it's that emotional labor it's invisible labor it's affective labor kind of all in one and um i was just in conversation about this uh in connection with a group that i work with um, where we're kind of looking to raise money for a program and thinking about like, when is it even sort of ethical and how do we make use of people's stories? And one of the leaders of the group um, shared that uh, when she had told her story of oppression um, about a very stigmatized issue, um, that at first she was really on board and she was excited about how she became kind of a, a face for and she was asked to testify in a lot of different places but ultimately feels that her story was used by a sort of white led organization um, and ended up feeling used in the process and sort of tokenized by the end of it. And so I, I think sort of thinking about when we use stories and how we use stories and recognizing those as labor, I just think it's a really important area and I thank you for, for making that question. So, um, with that, we're a couple minutes over, um, but I think we should probably close out. And I just want to say thanks to everyone for attending and tell all your friends that next week is the last week. So we'll have a big giant feminist shout out party and um, hopefully have some ways of thinking through next steps. Uh, where do we all go from here and um, how we can work together uh, in some future way beyond Friday reading groups. Um, and also so just to make sure, there is content next week too. It, like we- Oh we yeah, there is content. Yeah, we're there not is, just hanging out. There's more stuff. There's more stuff. <laughs> All right, bye everybody. Okay, take care everyone.